I'm recording. I am not in the same place I was last week. I'm on the campus of Reed Hardman University. But we have a really good internet connection, so I think things should go a little, maybe a little better. Yes. In our last class, I had said we were going to begin today in Acts chapter 20. So go ahead and turn your Bibles there, and then we'll then we'll have a prayer, and we'll get started. Let's pray. Most righteous Heavenly Father, the Lord of Abraham, the Lord of the heaven and of the earth. We give you thanks for your grace and your mercy. We give you thanks for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die because of us for saving us. Thank you for leading us here at this time. We are going to discuss something about church leadership. We ask you, Father, to bless our mind, bless our teacher, is be with him so that he can continue to teach us in a right way. Forgive us in our sins, Father. If I pray you, it is through us of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. We we got to the end of the first lesson last time, and I wanted to pick up in Acts chapter 20. I know that these lessons are planned for elders, which I think will do two things. One, the information that's in these lessons is good for any of us, as far as application goes, to these Bible principles. The other is to give ideas to help you men as evangelists to start working on developing elders uh, for the congregations uh, where you're going to be serving. You may have studied this before, but I want to do it again. It's very interesting that a lot of uh, preachers, as you know, in uh, denominational churches will refer to themselves and others will refer to them as pastors. And there's no, as you know, there's no such thing as a single pastor in any congregation of the Lord's Church in the New Testament. But there are pastors or shepherds in plurality church, and I want to look at Acts chapter 20. You'll notice in beginning with verse 17 that Paul was in Miletus and he had sent to Ephesus where Timothy was the preacher and call to him the elders of the church. And I want you to notice these words with me. I'm not looking at the entirety of what we read in Acts chapter 20. But the word for, for elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17 is the same word that we would get in English words, presbyters. Yes, sir which would suggest uh, elder, suggests age, wisdom, experience, and um, the Greek word is presbyter or presbyteros, and it's one, of course, if he's advanced in years, he's also, as you know, one of the qualifications for an elder is that he is not to be a novice. So you've got two things here. One... He's not a new Christian, but he's also not a real young man. He needs to have enough life experience to have raised a family and have faithful children. But I'm looking at these words today because, you know, the Bible sometimes is kind of subtle for us, but some things are, they're there for us to study. So Paul calls for the elders. With the first thing you see is he calls for a plurality of men. Yes. Acts 14, verse 23, you know, the elders, plural, were appointed in every church. So all the churches of the New Testament, if they had elders, they had at least two. Um, there's no such thing as one elder in a church. But... Uh, 
even so, that, that's another discussion as well. But so we have him calling for these presbyters, these elders, these older, senior, more advanced in years, uh, men who are elders in the Lord's church. And you have some references here. You know, it's in 1 Peter 5 and verse 1. Peter writes to the elders, and he says, who am also a fellow elder. And so, obviously, Peter's older at this point in his life. And naturally, if we want, if we're going to have men shepherding the Lord's church, we need men with wisdom and, and age and experience. Young people have some really good ideas, but there's one thing young people will not have till they get older, and that's experience. And it's just, we see the wisdom in it. Uh, while you're growing and learning, you keep doing that. But an elder is an older person. The next thing we see is we get down here to verse 28. Um, the, he tell, Paul tells the elders... In Ephesus, to be on guard to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's another word for the elders, or it's sometimes they're called bishops, overseers. And this word carries with it the idea of superintendence or rule. The, the elders obviously have the last say in the things that the church does. That is, as long as what they're saying is in accordance with Scripture. But somebody has to be in authority. And the Lord, of course, we know the qualifications that the Lord gives for elders, and he, you know, they're all necessary. And when you put all those together, you have a man who desires that role, then he's prepared to be an elder with other elders. And a part of that work is to oversee the work of the church, which means they don't do everything, but they make sure things are done the way they ought to be. And of course, they should do these things according to the will of God. And I'm not getting into the details of this uh, role at this point, but simply noting these different words. So you have elders or presbyters, which is older men, and you have bishops or overseers who superintend, oversee the church, and and of course there, there are a lot of things. You know, in Titus chapter one, one of the things that the elders were to do was to make sure that false teachers were dealt with properly. Um, or to make sure that people in the church are doing the things they ought to be doing. I can tell you if you if you start working with a congregation as a preacher, you're going to see if you study the role of elders, you're going to see how important it is to have those men in place. I'm older than you guys, and I've been serving in the church for some years, and I, I don't, as I've noted before, uh, I don't have elders where I'm preaching, but I sure wish I did. It sure would, because this is God's plan, and it would make things a lot better. And I've seen churches with good elders, and they can do so much more. The church can just so much more done. So you have older men who are presbyters or elders, and you have bishops or overseers. And so your, your word there is episcopos for these bishops. It's kind of like you get a kind of like a transliteration almost from Episcopos to Bishop, uh, one who inspects, a watcher, a guardian. Then you have pastors, shepherds. And naturally, one of the main jobs, I guess if you put it all together, other than the fact that they're older, they have this responsibility to superintend, the ultimate responsibility of these shepherds is to take care of God's people. You know, when Jesus told the parable in Luke 15 about the man who had a hundred sheep and lost one, the 99 left in the wilderness were not, uh, not of any, no concern to him. They were just doing okay. 
But the one that wandered away and got into trouble, you know, Jesus said he'd go and look for that lost sheep until he found it. And that's the role of elders. And to make sure that God's sheep are taken care of. And so you have these three different words here. The word for pastor or shepherd is poimano. It means to feed, to pasture, or to tend. So you think about a real shepherd over sheep. Um, and you got Psalm 23. That's pretty descriptive. You know how the Lord is his shepherd. And David uses uh, sheep, shepherd, and sheep terminology. And how... The shepherd would look after the sheep, but they have to have attitude, and uh, they've got to be taken care of if, if they're suffering from emotional or spiritual issues. Uh, to feed, of course, they feed them God's word, and that's what Paul had told the elders in Ephesus, you know, to, to build themselves up, to build themselves up in, in God's word first for themselves and then so that they could take care of the sheep and so we have these three words that are vital terms that deal with elders elders who are older or presbyters bishops or overseers pastors or shepherds and um so when you but here's here's a point these words are applied to a plurality of men so when you go to over, for example, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 for just a moment, where Paul talks about uh, the development of leadership in the church. And you begin with about uh, verse, verse 10, we could, in Ephesians 4. This is not in your notes, but it's, it's, you might want to probably write this down, that Jesus descended and then he ascended far above the heavens so that all he might fill all in all things now in the first century you know that the Lord gave some to be apostles and we know who those men were those beginning with those men that uh, were disciples of John and then they began to be disciples of Jesus. And he trained these men for about three years. And, you know, we had 12. And we have the loss of one, Judas. And then later in Acts chapter 1, you know that Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place. And then later the apostle Paul. But this is not a hierarchy per se. Okay, it's when I mean hierarchy, it's not necessarily these are not necessarily authoritative positions, but developmental. And I want you to understand what I mean. Developmental. Jesus made apostles and he sent them all over. And their main job in the beginning was to, to represent him and then to preach the gospel and help get congregation started. And then you see that, so he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, necessary in the preaching of the gospel in the first century. As you know, they didn't have the New Testament, so they needed men who spoke by the Holy Spirit to teach. So this is developmental. These apostles, as you know, knew Jesus from the time of John. And then prophets were men that, say, for example, like, you, some that would receive the Holy Spirit to enable them in their preaching and it would be done by the laying on of the apostles' hands and they would have the Holy Spirit's ability to preach and then you, the next role that we see here are evangelists so you've got this higher, it's not a hierarchy but a developmental role you got apostles and then prophets going out preaching teaching well, Timothy's called an evangelist. And so his primary job was preaching. And you know his role was in the local church. Now, one of the things that Timothy and Titus were to do was to develop elders. 
And Paul was very specific about Titus in the island of Crete, as you know, that he was to complete those things that were lacking and, 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 his, and appoint elders in every city, which meant on the island of Crete, whatever churches, I'm sorry, whatever cities had a church in them, he was to go and get the get things going in the direction to, to establish elders in those churches. Men, I want you to think about something. When we read the New Testament, one of the first things, other than preaching the gospel, was to get the right kind of leadership in the Lord's church. And it starts with, uh, of course, you have to have an evangelist in place to preach and teach. But his job was to develop leadership to superintend like these men we read about in Acts chapter 20, older men and who would oversee and those who would pastor and shepherd. Um, denominational, as you know, denominational organizations, not scriptural. And the reason, and, and we have to ask, well, who has the wisdom to establish the right kind of leadership in the church? Well, it's God. He, he knows and he knew. And these qualifications make an eldership what it ought to be. Sometimes churches or preachers or both are hesitant about appointing elders because they think that an elder has to be perfect uh, in his life. Well, I would like for somebody to show me any perfect person in any church. I've never met one. And yet that doesn't mean that just put anybody in eldership they have to be qualified. But they're not going to be perfect because no man is. And I think sometimes you can't speak for every place. That sometimes churches don't have elders because preachers don't want them. Well, the question is, what does God want? What does the Lord desire? What did the Lord tell Titus to do for all those churches on Crete? To appoint elders in every city. And then you have the example in Acts 14, 23. They appointed elders in every church. Now, how long it takes to develop naturally depends on qualifications of the men. It may take 20 years. But at least effort should be in place. Uh, we can talk about that more later. But so the next thing you do, you have evangelists who would do the local work of a preacher, teaching, preaching. And then you have 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, where Paul instructs Timothy the things that he had heard from him among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the word for men there in Greek is anthropos, which is generic for males or females, which means that part of the work of a preacher is to help develop teachers, whether they be men or women. And, of course, we need women to teach the young people, the children, and sometimes to teach women. And we need men to teach. But out of those groups, you're going to get your elders they have to come from the local congregation somehow. And so the next thing you see then in Ephesians chapter 4, you have, you have apostles, you have some prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Well, that word pastor takes us back to Acts 20. Those men who were called elders or bishops or pastors or shepherds, um, and the reason I say, I want you to understand and make a note somewhere that Ephesians 4 is developmental and it's bringing the church to maturity. Notice that Paul goes on to say that the reason for these roles, these people, these men in these roles, according to verse 12, is for the equipping of the saints the work of service and you know and I know a non-working church is a dying church 
a non-serving church is a dying church. And we know from Revelation 3.15 that a lukewarm church is very displeasing to the Lord. How do we have growing, thriving, excited, on fire churches? Well, somebody says, well, if you don't preach the right sermons, people get excited. They will for a little while. But, you know, sometimes you don't even remember what sermon you preached two weeks ago. Well, how do you expect anybody else to remember it? So sermons are necessary, but the development of the leadership of the church is what will bring about workers in the kingdom equipping. Now, when you, when you think about equipping, you're, you're preparing the church. You're making them ready. For example, uh, you take a soccer team in Jamaica. So you have a team that comes out play. These boys have been playing for 10, 15 years. They're pretty good. Then you bring a team out there. They've only been playing for about a year. They all may be about the same age. They may have uniforms. They may have the right shoes. may have a good field. But they're not equipped. They've not been prepared to, to play that game. The difference is a 10 or 15 year experience team or even a five year experience team is equipped. So these leaders are given to equip the church for the work of ministry. Now, you know, when you think about it, do you want to do everything yourself as a preacher? I don't. I can't. I can't do everything myself. I'm just one man. And the Lord didn't want one person to do it. Jesus took 12 men to prepare them to go and get churches started. But he didn't leave them in the churches. He Well, he did Peter, but Peter changed roles. He changed roles from being an apostle to becoming an elder. So he had done the apostle job, but he didn't keep that up. The apostle Paul remained an apostle all of his life. But he never did become an elder because he had that job to do. And so when you get down here to the evangelists, and then he says some pastors and teachers, one of the jobs of a preacher, we don't have any uh, apostles today. We don't have any prophets, but we do have evangelists. And one of our jobs as evangelists is to develop pastors and teachers. And I would like to expound on that a little bit. You know, one of the qualifications of an elder is to be a teacher. And then in uh, Titus chapter 1, he's supposed to be able to, to deal with those who contradict themselves, to teach error. Well, how does he do that? He has to be a student of the Bible which means he's got to be prepared to be a student of the Bible. And he has to be taught. He has to be encouraged to do that. Because an elder is supposed to know the Word of God. He needs to know it for himself. He needs to know it for the church. He needs to know it for people that would speak against God's Word. And he need, you know, he knows needs to know how to live it. And so watch what watch the, how this unfolds. So you got the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. You know, when you see a building going up, the first thing they put up is not the roof, is it? First thing they do is prepare the ground, then they'll put a foundation. Then they'll start building walls. And then they'll start putting up support for a roof. Then they'll put a roof on it. And then they start finishing the, the doors and the inside to make that building complete. Well, look, looking at it from a spiritual perspective, 
these, these especially today, evangelists and elders are to build up the church, to, to make the church be everything it ought to be. And it'll never be everything it ought to be until brethren will look at these texts and let it grow. He says, notice verse 13, until we attain to the unity of the faith, that is till the teaching of the gospel, the New Testament comes together, and it's not simply the unity of, well, it, it goes back to these seven ones earlier, but pulling all those together, everything together, and unifying the church and strengthening it, strengthening it. And he says, and the knowledge of the Son of God. And to the to a mature man. Now I being mature at different ages. Um some some young men are very mature at 16. Now that doesn't make them the same as a 30 year old, but they're very mature for their age. Some men are 45 years old and they're still immature. Some of them are 60 years old and they're still immature. They may be 60 years old in age, but they're immature in other ways. Well, think about a church like that. A church needs to start maturing, developing teachers, knowledge of God's word, teachers. Um, working on men to be elders and deacons and elders' wives and deacons' wives and maturing the church uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness. I'm in the last part of verse 13, which belongs to Christ. The purpose in this is to fill up what Jesus has done. If you go back and you look... Um, that Jesus, according to verse 11, he gave, in the beginning, you know, he gave these positions. He was physically on earth and started, as you know, his disciples who became apostles. And then it just went on from there. Even when he went back to heaven, you got your prophets, evangelists. You remember Philip was an evangelist. And so, and Timothy was, and Titus was, but Timothy and Titus were not pastors. You'll never see anywhere in either any of those letters that Paul called those preachers pastors. And and I'm not trying to I'm not throwing that out as a debate or den with denominational preachers. You could use it for that, but the point is that's not my role. If I'm not an elder, I'm not a pastor. If I'm an elder and there's another elder, then we have an eldership, then I'm one of at least two pastors. But as a preacher, that's not my role. And when these roles develop, you see the church growing and blossoming and becoming and becoming stronger like Jesus wants it to be. And then you see the power or the result of this in verse 14. Notice, as a result, we are no longer children. Now, Paul's using a figure that he's talking about maturity. The church is no longer like children. I don't mean this in any kind of unkind or, uh, you know, just in an ugly way, but, a, but I know from seeing churches with good elderships and seeing churches without elderships, churches without elderships in many ways are like children. They're not, in the sense, the church is not mature like it ought to be. It's like a child is limited in what he or she can do. And so is a church without elders. They're limited. The reason being, God wants them. If you don't get anything else out of these lessons for the next few months, think solely about how we can get elders in the churches. It may take a long time, 
but it'll never happen unless we plan for it. And notice then, you have these things in place. You have the fullness of Christ in verse 13, mature me in verse 13, knowledge, verse 13, unity. So you got unity, knowledge, maturity, uh, the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we're no longer children. Watch this, tossed here and there by waves carried about by every wind of doctrine. Now, that spot and go back to Acts chapter 20 for just a moment. I want you to notice something. Um, as you know, the Bible kind of we kind of weaves like a basket when you start putting things together. But you go back over here to Acts chapter 20, and and Paul is speaking to these elders. And, and he tells them in uh, verse 28, as you all know, be on guard, watch this, be on guard for yourselves. Elders have to start with themselves and for all the flock. So the elders are responsible for themselves and the entire church, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The church doesn't belong to me. The church belongs to God. Jesus bought it. We know that. But notice what he says in verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, Paul said, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So, he's, so let's go ahead and look at verse 32. Then, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, you know, as long as at this point where you've been in school, you've improved in your knowledge. You've been studying, and every time you preach, if you're like me, you learn something every time. And the more you read, the more you learn, and then the more you're able to apply. And so you become better prepared to deal with those things that are contradictory to the will of God because you know the Bible better. That's fine, but it's even more imperative for an elder because the elders are responsible for the whole church. And something obviously was going to happen at Ephesus. Paul said it would. And one of the things that would keep now, some sheep are going to be stolen, men, because some people aren't going to listen to anybody but what they want to hear. And the best elders in the world can't change that. If a person wants to hear something else, nobody can, you know, Paul, uh, God couldn't even change Cain's mind. He talked to Cain. Cain did what he wanted to. And so... You need, we need to remember that, but at the same time, the elders have a responsibility to keep as many sheep from falling away as they can, which means they'd have to deal with the false teacher, with the struggle that some Christian might have who's been listening to this error, which means they have to know God's word. And because he says, first of all, I commend you to God, God's word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Let's make an application to ourselves for a moment as preachers. If we want to be good men for God and good preachers, God's word has to build us up first. It has to. How would you like a surgeon? You're going to, you're going to have to have serious surgery. And I'm assuming it's the same in Jamaica as it is in the United States. Doctors have to stay up to date on current knowledge, 
and 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 techniques for surgery. They have to stay on top of it all the time. New things are discovered, new methods are discovered, and, and they have to have schooling. They have to, every now and then they have to keep their, their license. Now you do you want to go to see a surgeon who hasn't done any improvement in that area in the last 10 years? I wouldn't. I want somebody that's been on top of things because my life is in jeopardy. Well, the same is true with our work as preachers. We have to stay abreast because other people's souls are in jeopardy. So the same principles apply to us to know God's word, especially and before and until elders are in place. I can't take the place of elders. But I can study, and I can preach, and I can encourage, and I can help brethren know what they need to know. So know this section, because I'm going to ask you about it on test. Know this section. Um, I, and I'm going to, you've got Ephesians 4 in here. Verse 11 is noted under pastors. But study that and think. You see the picture that the Bible gives on those. Do you all have any questions at this point or comments? Um, yes, sir. As you just um, teach us that elders um, they're play great role in the church because Paul Apparently, Timothy and Titus to do the same thing to appoint the elders. Now, is it fair for us today who do not have elders in a church uh, who is there for more than, let us say, 20 years? Is it fair to do not have any elders after that period of time? Let me let me answer it this way. You can only work with what you have. But the question is, what are you going to do in the next 20 years to try and develop elders? Um, the effort has to be made. And, and you guys, some of you guys are really smart because I've talked to you. you. You have a good mind. And so you have the ability to study and understand and think, okay, instead of thinking about 20 years, just think about, okay, what can I be doing to help get elders? Um, it may not take 20 years. Um, the time, only time will tell. Some of the people that you teach may be 10 years old right now, and they may not become elders until you're dead. If you're planting the seed, teaching them how to be, what's expected of them. Brothers, I think we've done a pretty good job uh, um, in, in the Lord's body of finding preachers. Men want to preach. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think on the, on the broader scale, we've not done a good job developing leaders. And the thought of it comes to my mind. Well, when I read when I read my New Testament, I know that you already had some mature men who were Jews in the early church. But I figure it took the Apostle Peter a little time to get ready. Don't you? He had some things to work on, but even so, he started out preaching. When did he become an elder in Jerusalem? I don't know. But the point I'm making is work on it. Don't put a time frame on it. Make a plan. Okay, what do I need to do for this to happen? Forget about the calendar. But look at, okay, do, do this and this, okay. And maybe you see a young man uh, that he has that quality. Instill that desire in him. Help him develop in every spiritual way that he can. Men who are elders that I respect the most are very 
spiritually minded men. They have wisdom. They know the Bible. Take young men in that direction. If you convert someone uh, and their children become Christians, you know, work on them. You have to have at least two. And, a, and the, the, the first thing I'd ask you to do is pray about this. Ask God to help you. Because it's his work. It's not our work. It's his plan, not our plan. And I want to share something with you that I've been praying about a lot of things lately, that, um, personal things. I've been praying real hard. And I've been seeing some things happen because of those prayers. And God didn't answer those prayers when I first asked, but I'm starting to see some of them happen. And so do you, do you want to see elders in the Lord's church like the Lord wants? Well, I know you do. Ask him to help you. Uh, and, and I, you know, and study and just work. Don't worry about it. Don't let it become a burden. Well, I'm not getting this done. I'm not getting this done. You just do what you can. Let God take care of the rest of it. And he will. But wouldn't it be wonderful to maybe your children would see elders someday when you're gone? You know, we, we, we build things for the next generation. I, I'm not going to be around... As many years as I've been here, uh, unless I live to be 130 years old, I don't think I'm going to make it that far. <laughs> but you know, I hope some good things will happen after I'm gone that I've done today. And don't give up on it. Just because you're not seeing something happen, don't, don't give up on it. Uh, and we're going to get into more of that in our next lesson. Um, yes, sir. I, I, I see more. Um, I don't know if this is too good. A pastor, we need some qualification. But, like when we look at and they were today, I think that is everywhere. Even we don't have that qualification, but we always present ourselves as, as a pastor. How can we help those who don't, especially those who are not a member of the church, like those who are the member who, like if you study with them, they will know, we will show them the qualification. Someone must have to be pastor, but how can we avoid that? Are you... I want to make sure I hear what you're saying because it's a little hard to hear. Are you asking how to keep the church from looking at you as a pastor? Was that um, your question? Yes. I, yeah, I said, um, as you know, today, if when, we, when someone just came to preach or go in the pulpit to preach, people call them pastors. And we know we have some qualification that someone was up to be a pastor. But how can we avoid that? Like, especially for those who are not a, a Christian, meaning those who are not the member of the church. For the members, we can study with them to show them the qualification. And I sometimes... Think, I think the thing you can... Something's happening here. Hang on a minute. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, something's going on here. Hold on a minute. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Something's happening here. Okay. You there now? I don't know what I'm sharing. I don't know what happened here. Hold on. There, we're back now, right? Okay. One of the things that I did 
when I was, uh, as you know, I work with a church that doesn't have elders. The first thing you need to understand is what is your role according to First and Second Timothy and Titus as an evangelist or a preacher. You need to understand your role. What is your job? And understand it well. And then teach the church what your role is as a preacher. Okay? Teach them. That's a part of the teaching process. It talks about teaching them what about elders. Well, what about teaching them about your role? Study it. Know what your job is. If people call you pastor, especially members of the church, uh, outside members are going to do that. Don't ever embarrass them over it. Please don't do that. But members of the church need to know I'm not a pastor. The Bible never calls a single preacher a pastor. and But I'm an evangelist or I'm a preacher. Teach them and help them understand. Um, and so you got three things there. One, you understand your role. And then you teach them what it what you teach them what your role is. And then you then the next thing, okay, well, what is a pastor? Teach the church the role of elders. Study it. So, okay, this is what the Bible says they are, and I'm not one, but hopefully someday we'll have some. Things like this take time. When I was in uh, Honduras a few years ago, um, same problem. Pastor, pastor. And I talked to the preachers. I said, why do you allow the church members to call you a pastor? And they said, well, we don't know. I said, well, you shouldn't let them do that. I can understand somebody that's in a denominational church that might say that there's a time to talk to them about it, but the church ought to know the difference. Is that your question? Yes. Any, any more questions? Okay. Let's take about a 15 minute break and we'll come back then. That'd be good. Yes. All right. Well, we'll be back in about 15 minutes then. Yeah. Thank you. 